This is tonight. It's good to see everyone here. We appreciate you coming out on our Wednesday evening summer series, and we're looking forward to a great lesson tonight. <clears throat> we'll introduce our speaker and uh, some of his family in just a few moments. Um, we'll let uh, most of the announcements be made at the end. I do want to add one note of uh, information. Uh, my sister called a little while ago and said that uh, her husband has been diagnosed with a um, brain tumor that they hope is benign at the base of his uh, no his um, yes his brain stem but anyway I was going to give you a particular name but that's irrelevant but uh, he uh, uh, they're hoping that it will be benign but surgery is probably going to be involved and so they have asked for an interest in our prayers and his name is uh, Brett Bailey um, and he lives in Houston, Texas. Brother Andrew Gary will be leading us in a song in just a moment. Seth Bowen will be leading us in a prayer. And then following that, I will introduce our speaker for the hour. So take a songbook and join in as we praise God together. And then um, in a moment, we'll talk about our speaker for the night. Number 369. 369. Sing the first and last verses. Jesus the loving shepherd calleth thee now to come into the fold of safety where there is rest and room. Come in the strength of manhood, come in the morn of youth. Enter the fold of safety, enter the way of truth. Lovingly, tenderly calling is he, wanderer, wanderer, come unto me. Patiently waiting, there standing I see, Jesus my shepherd divine. Lingering is but folly, wolves are up all today. Seeking the sheep who are straying, seeking the lambs to slay. Jesus the loving shepherd, calleth thee now to come. Into the fold of safety, where there is rest and room. Lovingly, tenderly calling is he, wanderer, wanderer, come unto me. Patiently waiting there, standing I see, Jesus my shepherd divine. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this time tonight. It's time where we can close a day with you. It's time, middle of the week, where we can focus our minds back on the things that are important. And Father, we're thankful for the church that meets here in Maysville. We're thankful for everyone tonight, for their willingness to serve you, for their dedication to be here. And Father, I pray that you will just continue to help encourage us as we encourage one another. Father, we're so thankful for Brother Kali and him being with us tonight. We pray that you will help him as he teaches to us tonight. We're thankful for him and his family and what they mean to your kingdom. And Father, we pray that you will continue to, to bless them in their work. Father, we're also thankful for your son, most importantly, for what he's done for us and for the example that he has, has led for us and he has shown us the obedience that is necessary. And Father, we pray that we would just always look to him. And Father, we're so thankful that, that you have given us an opportunity through him to be with you one day. Father, help us to always have that focus and that mindset that one day we will see you. And Father, we pray that as we enter in this hour of worship tonight that you will be with us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
We are grateful and thankful tonight to have Brother Glenn Colley with us. Uh, Brother Glenn preaches for the West Huntsville congregation where he has been there for some 10 years. Uh, he is accompanied to what tonight by his wife Cindy and also by his son Caleb. They also have one other daughter, Hannah, who is married and off um, doing all of the kinds of things that children do when they grow up. Glad to have Brother Glenn here. We were reminiscing a few minutes ago, and um, I'm thinking it was about 1990 when I first invited uh, Glenn Colley to come to Huntsville to speak on a summer series. Um, as I recall, he'd never been to Huntsville before, and now here he is, not only living and, and uh, working here, but our neighbor just across the uh, the back corner, and we're glad to have the, the uh, Colleys as part of our family. Um, Glenn and I went to school and college, but you'll be able to tell by looking at us that he had already gone off and done a lot of life and came back to college as an old man uh, when I was starting there as a freshman. And uh, so he's just, you know, got lots of mileage on him. But we're, uh, we're glad to have Glenn here. Glenn is a, uh, a constant draw. He and Cindy both are... Uh, prominently featured on many lectureships and speaking opportunities throughout the Brotherhood, and we are grateful to have him. Uh, Brother Glenn has been with us several times, uh, although he stood me up the last three years to get here tonight, but uh, I won't tell you about that on account of how much he paid me to say nice things about him. We are glad to have Glenn. He's a good friend. He's a good student of the Scripture. Brother Glenn is also a one of the elders at the congregation of West Huntsville. And his topic tonight is particularly appropriate, considering his place in that church, speaking on great things in the Lord's church, Jesus, our good shepherd, and local shepherds. And we're glad to have Brother Glenn speak on those topics. He says he doesn't want to stand or a microphone, so I'm going to move these things out of the way and uh, give you Glenn Colley. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I love Tim Orbison. And uh, now what he said about Fried Hardeman and being a freshman when I came, there in many ways Tim is still a freshman. <laughs> and none of what he said was true. And uh, Tim, Tim is my close friend, and he's the kind of friend where, where you, uh, I hope you have friends like that. Uh, well, I mean, I know Tim's your friend. I mean... I hope you have close friends like I have a friendship with Tim because we tease a lot and we barb each other a lot and um, and we enjoy being together and he's the kind of friend with whom I can become very serious when I really need to talk about something serious and I'm, I'm really happy to be in the kingdom at the same time as Tim Orbison and I'm happy to be here with you tonight. I want to talk about two passages of scripture. You're going to need your Bibles. We're going to walk expositorily through these two passages, which are my favorite passages on the subject of shepherds shepherding. All right, so please get your Bible and open up to 1 Peter chapter 5. That will be our first passage. I'm going to talk about it for a while, go verse to verse, and then we're going to jump over to another one. This first passage has to do with shepherds in the local congregation and some instructions that Peter gives, and it starts this way. The elders which are among you. Now that word elder is presbyteros. There are a couple of different words, major words for elders or shepherds or bishops in the New Testament, episkopos. And they mean very similar things. And it's about, what, well, it's what you think. It's, it's about, here are the men who are in charge of making sure that that which is done in the church is done rightly. All right? The elders which are among you, I exhort... I love that. May I ask you a question? Are you a, are you a person who is pro-elders or are you anti-elders? I don't mean do you think we should have them or not. I, I mean how, how do you feel about elders in general? I like Peter because Peter, I mean he's an elder himself, but Peter wants to encourage elders. Do you encourage elders? I, I hope you do. I can remember uh, when I first became an elder how it felt on that first Sunday. I didn't really anticipate this, but, but sitting down in the pew, and it was the Sunday when the announcement was made, 
I mean, you know, there's a dividing line. You're not, and then, then you are. You're not, and you are. Okay. And then it's just, so now I am. And, and to look over the congregation and to think, I, I bear a responsibility for these Christians. It's a very sobering reality. And, and uh, I realized a number of things, and one of them is that, that elders are flesh and blood. They're just people who love the Lord's church and want what's best for it. And we ought to be encouragers of elders. But I don't, I don't want to stop there because I really want to challenge you to think about not just elders which exist now, but those who will exist in the future. Look around you and who will be the next elders? Who will be the elders after them? Now, we, we do something that I think is kind of nutty in the church sometimes in reference to selecting new elders, and that is that we wait until somebody up and dies, and then we look around the church and we say, hmm, who can we get? Sort of a panic mode, right? It's an, we've got to get somebody. Who can we get? And that's a real risky situation because you, you, you're just apt to compromise the qualifications of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus 1 and pick somebody who's going to hurt the church. may not be this year, may not be next year, but will hurt the church because we did it wrong. May I suggest to you that this spirit that says, I love elders, I love shepherds, and I love the church should motivate us to be preparing young men to be elders. I wrote a little book called uh, Headed to the Office. It's a teenage class book. I'm not advertising it. I didn't bring one with me, so they're not for sale tonight. But, but why don't we have classes for our young men to start thinking about the qualifications and developing these qualifications already now as teenagers to be thinking like this? Why don't we say, and maybe you already do, I know that I do, I like to talk to our young men at West Huntsville whose qualities I admire to say, now look, you be studying your Bible. You be preparing yourself because one of these days the church is going to need to call on you to be one of our shepherds. I want you to be ready. Wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be so much better if, if the time comes when we need to ordain another elder or two if we could look across the church and say, we have this many men who are qualified. Now let's choose from those. Wouldn't that be something? Well, it isn't going to happen accidentally. It'll happen because we did some work years prior. What, you've got to do, what we've got to do is to be preparing elders for after we're dead and gone. If the Lord lets the world stand, this congregation's still going to be here. Who will be her shepherds? And the truth is, in, in most any organization, people don't rise above their elders, or their, their leaders, rather. Whatever organization, you don't rise above your leaders. It's true in the church, isn't it? So, I love this. The elders which are among you, I exhort. I want to be like that. I want you to be like that. Who am also an elder, Peter says. Is it all right for a preacher to be an elder? Well, yes. Is it always a wise thing? Well, no. Sometimes it's unwise. And every congregation has to decide that. And I, I didn't come to talk about that. But except to say that, that Peter demonstrates here that it's not something which is unscriptural. It's a right thing to do if the church deems it appropriate. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now, here's an elder who is anticipating heaven. I, I want to be around a man like this. I, I was preaching years ago. I don't remember where, but I remember one of the elders who was a dear man came to me and said, Glenn, you must always give them hope. Always give them hope. I, I like that. I've tried to practice that in my preaching, and I know that Tim does. Uh, here's a man, Peter, an apostle who writes by inspiration, and he, he's uh, dreaming of heaven. He, he calls it glory. I, I'm anticipating going to glory. You know, Paul talked about it in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I, I'm now ready to be offered the time of my departure is at hand. Peter talked about it in 1 Peter chapter 1, an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. I love to be around an elder for whom heaven is a reality. He speaks of it in anticipation, in eager anticipation, because he appreciates the Savior who said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive it to myself. Where I am, there you may be also. Right? A 
partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the church of God, which is among you. And let's put part of that burden on their shoulders. The shepherd's responsibility is to make sure that the food, that spiritual food that the church gets is the right kind. You feed a church of people weeds of false doctrine, and before long, apostasy will occur. The elders are the ones that, that, that stand at the gate, and they make sure, they, their job is to make sure that what's being taught in classes and the pulpit and wherever it is, these people among them, that what they're getting is the truth. In the 1990s, the church of my Lord faced a great apostasy. And almost every church in the brotherhood split. It's a very sad reality. You go to, today to a city of any appreciable size and even some small towns, you have two different kinds of churches of Christ. What a crying shame. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, two churches of Christ. By that I don't mean just two congregations. I mean two different kinds of churches of Christ. You, you could choose, right? And which all we call one kind we call maybe uh, contemporary. And what's happened is that what happened in the 90s and happened at West Huntsville. I wasn't here. But uh, just a massive deviation from the truth. And, a, and, and you have these congregations that split away because they wanted to disassociate themselves from faithful congregations, faithful churches. And, 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 so, there, and so there you go. Feed the church of God. And so it's a good thing for elders to pop into classes sometimes just to listen to what's being taught, to make sure it's good. It, it's appropriate for elders to, to talk to people before they become teachers, to say, now let, let's talk about these kinds of doctrines and tell me where you are. And talk, let's talk about the scriptures and to have that exchange, that kind of dialogue so that, so that they know. Because you know, the fact of the matter is, when the day is over, the elder's going to be responsible for what's being taught in that congregation. It's true about the pulpit. And you know what? If false doctrine, and I don't mean just a man who, who makes a, he mis, misspeaks or makes a mistake that happens, but if a man came to the pulpit and taught false doctrine, it oughtn't to be the question, will one of the elders come to the pulpit and correct it? It just ought to be the question, which one will, will do it? And, and maybe they would look at each other, glance at each other, and do this. That is to say, you want me to do it or you want to do it? But one of them would come to the pulpit and say, Brethren, what we've heard tonight is not true, and here's why. And have a conversation about that, because they would know that on their shoulders rests the responsibility of feeding that flock. That's who they are. That's what they're about. They're episkopos. They're presbyteros. They are the shepherds of that flock. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Let's take that little phrase. Which is among you. I think that's very interesting. Because, because of placing membership. Have you ever wondered why we say a person should place membership when that phrase is not actually in the Bible? I don't care what you call it, but, but the concept is appropriate and biblical. I mean, follow me on this. Over whom do the elders have, if you please, jurisdiction? Uh, whose souls are they to watch over? And the answer is, 1 Peter 5, those who are among you. If a person visits your assembly here, the first time, are the elders responsible for that person's soul? You say, well, no, 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 right. What about two times, three times, five times? What about six times? After they visit six times, is it some you know, kind of a transitional time, and now the elders are responsible for their souls? I, no, I would say no. There has to be some way that a person indicates to the shepherds, I want to be among you. I want to be part of this family. I don't care what you call them. You don't give a place. Remember? When I was a kid, it was very common for the preachers in giving the invitation, offering the invitation to ask if people wanted to be baptized, if they wanted to be restored, or do you want to place membership with us? And that was, that's okay with me. That was a common practice. But, but what's important is that the shepherds who are responsible for the souls of those Christians have an indication. Now I want to be among you. The elders are the shepherds of those people. Feed the church of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof. Postmodernism has dealt us quite a blow. It took a while to get to us, and by us I mean to the Lord's church. Postmodernism is 
boy, you know, I, uh, I could spend a lot of time talking about this, but that wouldn't be a, a smart thing to do. You didn't come to hear about that. But to suffice it to say that a major component of postmodernism is that there are no absolute truths and that things which have been accepted as true uh, are all under scrutiny and should be questioned perpetually. That is that, and as it applies to religion and sometimes in the church today, we're seeing the emerging church come up and, and uh, instead of talking about Christianity in the way that you would, a postmodernist, an emerging church person would talk about, talk about it as a conversation because it's an ongoing, we never come to any conclusion type of philosophy, which of course is damnable. You cannot reconcile this kind of idea, this kind of concept with the truth of the New Testament. The New Testament represents itself as being the truth of God to which we'll be held accountable. Well, if you're part of that mentality though, if, if you adopt the postmodernist kind of philosophy, then there's a verse that's going to drive you crazy. And it's Hebrews 13, 17. I mean, this one sends them for a loop. You know what it says? Obey them that have the rule over you, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account, that it may be well with thee, that they may serve with joy and not with grief, because that's unprofitable. Now, if you're into this mentality, the, the very notion that elders would have authority just seems so foreign. That just can't be right. Cannot be right. Well, to whom does this apply? Obey. There's somebody that you're supposed to obey because they watch for your souls and they're ultimately going to give an account for how they do that. All right? Who is that? I was in California, I don't know, a few months ago, and I heard a lecture from, from a man, and he spent the whole time on this verse to say that this, this doesn't have to be the elders. And as he would develop it, it was so obvious it was the elders, and I think he felt self-conscious. And he, at one point he said, I know, I know, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, but it doesn't have to be the elders. This doesn't have to refer to the elders. To whom does it refer? Obey them that have the rule over you, for they watch for your souls, and they're going to give an account for that. In 1 Timothy 5 and 17, the Bible says that the elders who rule well are deserving of double honor especially those who, who labor in the word and in doctrine. They rule well. The elders rule well. Or in 1 Timothy chapter 3, one of the qualifications is that an elder has to rule well his own house. Because if he doesn't know how to do that, how is he going to take care of the church of God? Hebrews 13, 17 is about the elders. It's about the shepherds of the flock who are going to one day give an account for how they shepherd that flock, right? Obey them that have the rule over you. Now back to our text in 1 Peter chapter 5. He says they're overseers. They're overseers. They're, they're the ones charged with the responsibility to make sure that what we're doing is adhering to the will of God. Elders do not legislate. They're not legislators. They, they do not create new laws. They merely make sure that what the flock is doing is adhering to the law of Jesus Christ. They're shepherds. Think about all that's involved in that. They, they make sure that, that the flock is fed. We've been talking about that. They, they make sure that when a sheep strays away uh, into, into sin, that, you know, these kinds of shepherds, that with this, this mentality of shepherding, they, they would not be boardroom elders. They would be living room elders. You know what I mean? The boardroom eldership, and you can, you can degenerate down into that, where, where a boardroom eldership is one that, that does all of its work in an office somewhere. Now, you've got to have meetings. I don't know how you'd be an eldership without meetings. You've got to do that. But, but shepherds are in people's homes. Shepherds who shepherd the flock are, are helping people who are straying away to come back and, and ultimately in, in perpetual or persistent sin would lead the church in the withdrawal of fellowship because that's shepherding, that's caring for the flock. And you can read 1 Corinthians 5 and, and understand that better. They're shepherds, they're overseers. They feed the church of God which is among them. Now we go on. 
Not by constraint, but willingly. No, yeah, a man doesn't need to be an elder because he feels coerced into it. Don't, don't do that because he's going to hurt you. If his heart's not in it, ultimately it's going to fail. He, he's going to hurt you. He won't mean to, but he will. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, that's ill-gotten gain, but of a ready mind. And then he says, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Lords over God's heritage. If you had a man who in his heart felt that he really wanted to be an elder because then he would have the power, you, you make sure he doesn't become an elder. He'll hurt you. Make, make sure he never becomes an elder. He's got the wrong approach and he'll hurt you. Shepherd is not a title. Shepherd is a job description. Right? And it's, 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 I, occasionally I'll get a call from a man. A couple of weeks ago a man called me and he said, uh, Glenn, uh, the church has asked me if I will serve as one of the elders. And I don't know if I'm ready. And I, I want to talk about it. And so we did. I like that spirit. It isn't that he didn't desire it. He did. It's that when he stood there and looked at it, he realized the responsibility that would be on his shoulders. And, and he, he approached it with a sense of awe and a sense of fear, and a sense of joy, and a sense of nerve, all those kinds of emotions welled up inside of him. And, and I think that's the right approach to this. No, don't be a, you're not a lord over God's heritage. You know what else that implies? Is that a man, a man can never be, must never be a head elder. You must never have a head elder in a church. Why not? Well, because it distorts the whole picture. Because it fails. The, the concept fails. You've got to have a plurality of elders. And every elder at the table ought to feel free at all times to speak his heart. Right? No head elders. No head elders. Because you can't lord it over the flock. That's not what this is about. It's, that's contrary to shepherding. And he's teaching shepherding here. But being examples to the flock. That is to say that the elders wouldn't require faithfulness of other people that they wouldn't be willing to do themselves. And then he concludes, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, we shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. I, I love that. A few weeks ago, one of our elders, Arnold Wright, passed away. Some of you knew Arnold very well. And he was very dear to my heart. And... And when he left, when he died, why? Well, he left a mighty big hole in the church. We, we miss him for a number of reasons. One was that Arnold had a kind of a photographic memory and he had this mind. He was kind of an engineer type fellow. So not much personality, you know, but a lot of smart. And uh, I'm just teasing for those of you who are engineers. But Arnold was a terrific man and, and we, uh, we miss him. I talked to him just before he died. And, uh, his faith was consistent up until he took his last breath. And the last conversation that we had when we talked about heaven, I want you to remember me on the other side, I said. We talked about going over to the other side. It wasn't very long. He knew it. No reason to, no reason to talk differently. And we prayed. And what a great elder. What a great elder. That's, that's what we need. Shepherd of the flock. Because we're looking for the chief shepherd. Okay, now let's make a transition. I said two passages, and already that clock is kind of chasing me. Tim said I could have an hour and ten minutes, so we're well into that now. Just kidding. All right. Now the second passage. I want to talk about the chief shepherd. So we're making quite a major transition here. Let's just shift gears in our minds and, and talk about the chief shepherd. And to do that, you won't be surprised that we're going back to the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Would you just enjoy this psalm with me? See, because I, I, think, I think we make a mistake only reading this at, at uh, cemeteries. This is not a psalm for the dead, it's a psalm for the living. And it'll bless your life. Now, the Lord is my shepherd. Don't you think it's interesting? I mean, let me get into your heart. Don't you think it's interesting that he didn't say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is your shepherd. Now, that's true, of course. That's not what he said. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. 
Never forget, there's a very personal aspect to the cross, a very personal aspect to the judgment day, right? The personal aspect to the shepherding of our Lord in our lives. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, would you watch? I want you to, I want to show you something I think is very interesting. As you read through the first three verses, David, the prophet, the sweet singer of Israel, speaks, speaks in first person. The Lord is my shepherd. He's talking about God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green path. Leads me beside the still water. Get to, get to verse 4. And then it makes a transition. He quits talking about God and starts talking to God. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You know what? You, if you love God, you, you don't talk about God very long before you need to talk to Him. Right? And that's what happens in this psalm. Don't ever be very far away from your next prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 says, pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean that all that you do is pray. It, it means that there's never a time in your life when you abandon prayer. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And man, a man by the name of Keller wrote a book about, he was a shepherd, wrote a book about shepherding. And he made the observation that a sheep won't lie down if there's agitation around him, be it threats from other animals or, or pests getting in his nose or, or whatever it happens to be, agitations or fears. If he's hungry, he's not going to lie down. A sheep will only lie down when all is peaceful and good inside of him. Now that, that's what the shepherd will do for you. He's my shepherd, and he's going to lead me beside the still waters. He's going to let me lie down in those green pastures, and that's pretty sweet. I, I think about Philippians chapter 4, and the Apostle Paul would talk about this, and he said, now look, I... I I know how to live in both kinds of, of the world. I mean, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. I know how, how to live when things are abundant, and I know how to live when I don't have anything. And then he says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which strengthens me. Now, see, that's shepherd. That's looking to the chief shepherd, right? And he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Does the chief shepherd restore your soul, Christian? Uh, do, you, do you, Christian, rejoice in the Lord? And in what ways would you say that the Lord restores your soul? I, I think there are a number of ways. Think about it. When I, when I read the 23rd Psalm, or 1 Peter chapter 5, I have encouragement and he restores my soul. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how, you, how you do that? How do you do that? You do that by studying the Word of God. And, and when you ingest the teachings of God's Word, then it restores your soul. When I, when I pray to him, he restores my soul. What would happen in your life if you couldn't pray? It's more important, you know, God talks to us through His Word and we talk to Him through prayer. It's more important that He talks to us than we talk to Him, of course. Having said that, prayer being something that we sometimes take for granted is something which we deeply crave if I say to you, what would happen in your life if you couldn't pray? It's kind of like your eyes. You don't think too much about your eyes. What a, what a tremendous blessing it is to be able to see. But you put on a blindfold and try to go through a half a day without them. And I, I can tell you, you're really grateful for them. Prayer restores my soul. My soul is restored by you. By, I mean, by being around Christians. Have you ever thought about the fact that the Lord could have made Christianity an isolated religion? I mean, isolated in the sense that, that everybody kind of does their own thing. I mean, you're a Christian, but what if he didn't make the church? What if you, what if you lived and existed as a Christian independent? Look around the, look at people around you. What if you didn't have them? I mean, what if we didn't have the church and a symbol like we do, but we were all independent? Sometimes it gets to be Wednesday night, and, and I don't know about you, but 
Uh, sometimes I'm just pretty exhausted by Wednesday. And, and sometimes the issues that I'm dealing with in my life and struggling with uh, are, are pretty heavy. By the time I get to Wednesday night, what my grandmother used to call prayer meeting, and, and then get around Christians. And you, you hear the, the sound of Christians before we started tonight in this assembly. If you listened, you heard the sound of Christians. It's just, it's, it's chattering. It's, it's hugging and kissing and shaking hands and, and, and uh, enjoying each other. And it's about compassion and listening to each other and exchanging. And you hear, you hear the sound of Christians. And it will revive you. I mean... It'll restore your soul. Isn't that true? I want to be around Christians. Christians are the best people on the earth. If you, if you want to, to look around you, what you will see is your family. I mean, at the end of the day, you want to know who your family really is? It's people who are members of the body of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the most important family that you have. And being with them is such a blessing. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now, now, wait a minute, wait wait a minute, this is not right. Something's gone terribly wrong here, because I I thought that that if I I would be faithful to the Lord, that 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 would mean that I get to have those green pastures, and I'm going to get to be beside the still waters. And what's this business about a valley and about death? Where's the green grass? Where's the still waters? And and see, look, the constant of the 23rd Psalm isn't the green grass. And see, we've got to to put that in our hearts. You'll be so severely disappointed in Christianity if you get this idea that if I'm going to walk with God, life's always going to be good. I'm telling you, he never promised it. He never did. And so now he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Incidentally, somebody said, I don't know if they're right or not, but said that that the valley of the shadow of death might not be death itself. That is your death. But perhaps has reference to the death of somebody that's very dear to me. Thus, the valley of the shadow of death. I die in the sense that I've lost somebody so very close to me. I don't know, but but I know this. The fact that I'm walking through the valley in my life, the fact that I am facing the shadow of death or death itself does not somehow suggest that God has abandoned me. Now, see, I've got to get that. This this valley and, and this shadow of death thing is not inconsistent with the reality that you have a shepherd, a chief shepherd, in your life. Oh, you gotta, you gotta, what, about, what about the book of Job? What's the purpose of the book of Job? Well, you, you know about the sufferings, but have you ever considered the fact that if you read the first two chapters of Job, you know more about what happened with Job. I'm talking about the devil, I'm talking about the inter- interaction with God and all of that. What really was going on here, if you read those first two chapters, you know more than Job ever learned, so far as we know. And Job questions God, I don't understand. How do we deal with the most bitter enigmas in life? How do you deal with that? And how do you connect the dots between these these hard, hard things that go on in our lives with the fact that we have a shepherd who's going to... How do you... So if he's there, if he's there, how come am I suffering? In the book of Job. So Job Job questions God. I don't understand. I don't understand why I haven't forsaken you. I've walked with you. And now look... Why, why is this happening? Do you know what God's answer was to that? Now, this is important. This is important. It's, it's chapter 38. And God's answer was, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? What kind of answer is that? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the, of the earth? The point is, Job, I'm God. I haven't abandoned you. And I know what I'm doing. I'm God. Had God abandoned Job? Oh, you know that's not true. God never abandoned Job. When Joseph was in prison, forsaken by his his father and his brothers, so far as he knew, 
suffering as a slave? Had God abandoned him? No, no. God was God had a plan for him. God was operating and acting as the chief shepherd just like he always does. The constant isn't the green grass. The constant isn't the water, the peaceful stream. I love those things, but that's not the constant. The constant is this. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's the constant. That's the constant. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou per- That's the constant. It's that, it's that God won't abandon you. Hebrews 13 and 5. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And even through the, the bitter times of life, the hard times of life, I know that I walk with a shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. He's my shepherd. And so the end of it comes like this. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, thou art with me. Rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Every time I read that, that part, I think about Stephen, Acts 7. They were gathering up rocks to throw at him. And God, God didn't promise to keep us out of problems or, or keep us, make us immune from suffering. And here he is about to be stoned to death, which must be a terrible way to die. And he says, look, I, I see the throne of God and I see Jesus standing on the right hand of God's throne. Well, they didn't like that one bit. They stoned him, but... Echoing my, in my ears is, I, I will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. That's what God did for Stephen. And he says, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, the Bible says that if this house of our tabernacle, it's talking about your physical body. Incidentally, it has an expiration date on it. You know that. You know that you're not designed to live forever here on earth. This, I mean, the older you get, the more, no matter what you do to try to stay young, you know, and people spend a lot of money about that, but we're not going to slow it down much. And, and we get old and we die. But, but we don't fear any evil here. He says in... 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, if this earthly tabernacle of, of our house was dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's the confidence I want you to have. That, that's why Jesus went to that cross and died, was so that you could have that. Now, as we conclude, I want to I finish up this way. In 1 Peter chapter 5, where we started tonight, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear you'll receive a a crown of glory that, you know the rest, that fades not away. I love that. So many of the sweetest things. Five more minutes? Is that what I got? Two more minutes. Bless your heart. That's okay. So many of the sweetest things of this life are sweet but only for a short amount of time. Tim, a while ago, was talking about my kids. And Cindy and I have, have and are enjoying them so very much. Uh, if you're Christians and you have a Christian family, every stage of your children's lives is wonderful. And, and that's how it is for us. Uh, 
But sometimes I, I uh, think about Hannah and Caleb when they're little, and Cindy likes to put out pictures about when they were little, and, and I would hold them in my arms. I, I was present for the birth of both of my children, and in both cases, the, the doctor or nurses or whoever was there was smart enough to let me hold them first. And I really treasure that memory. You can't buy that with money. That's a, that's a pretty wonderful thing. But they didn't stay little very long. And sometimes when I see your babies, see you holding your babies, it makes me a little bit sad to think that that wonderful time of our lives has faded away. Let me tell you something about heaven. Because Peter emphasizes this is something by inspiration that he wants to... He doesn't say it just this time in 1 Peter 5. He said it in 1 Peter chapter 1. He said about heaven this, that you as a Christian, because you're a child of God, you have an inheritance coming to you. And then here's the description. Incorruptible and undefiled, and it doesn't fade away. When we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we've just begun. And that's because we have a chief shepherd. Thank you very much.